Good morning, everybody. I'm not surprised but delighted to see such a large crowd. Welcome to the lecture on the development innovation economy, the 2013 Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture. My name is Kelly Brownell, and as of July 1st, I became the dean of the Sanford School. So what a pleasure it is for me to be here. Well, thank you. And in a few minutes, I'm going to accept the free t-shirt deal and disappear into the, the overflow room back there. Um, on behalf of the school, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here for a talk by our very special guest, USAID Administrator Dr. Rajiv Shah. The Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture Series was endowed by a gift to the university from the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust in honor of the late Terry Sanford. Many of you know that Terry Sanford was governor of North Carolina, a U.S. Senator, and president of Duke University from 1970 to 1985. He had a particular dream during his time as president of Duke, which is to establish a presence in public policy. What started off as a program became an institute and finally became the Sanford School of Public Policy. The purpose of this particular lecture series is to bring to campus men and women of the highest personal and professional stature, and unquestionably we have achieved that goal today. USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, is the primary agency that extends America's helping hand to people across the world, to those struggling to live a better life, or recover from disaster, or striving for freedom and democracy. That mission has led the USAID to support countless programs around the world, including here at Duke, at Sanford, and in neighboring institutions such as RTI. For example, USAID provided funding to create and support the highly innovative Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator at Duke, known as SEED. It is an interdisciplinary network including centers, at the Fuqua School of Business, the School of Medicine, the Global Health Institute, the Pratt School of Engineering, and faculty from across the campus, including from Stanford. USAID also supports creative work here at Stanford, including the Duke <coughs> Cook Stove Initiative, led by Stanford Professor Sabrendu Patnayak and involving Professors Mark Julin and Alex Fopp. This studies the use of solid fuel cook stoves and methods to increase adoption of improved, less polluting cook stoves. This group has published important papers on the ecological benefits and the public health benefits, especially for women, of adopting the new cook stoves and techniques. We have other connections with USAID. This summer, Sanford's Duke Center for International Development trained 18 USAID and foreign government officials in fiscal policy and public finance management. The program was developed through the USAID-funded Leadership in Public Financial Management Project. Now, a bit more about the man leading this operation. After earning his MD and master's degree in health economics from the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Shaw served for seven years with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. From there, he joined the Obama administration as the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics and chief scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He was sworn in as USAID's administrator in 2009. In this capacity, he managed the U.S. response to the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. He co-chaired the State Department's first ever review of American diplomacy and development operations and leads Obama's landmark food security initiative. Dr. Shaw is here tonight to talk about innovation and new directions for meeting the challenges facing the 10,000 professionals in 80 missions around the world that you make up the USAID. We have in our presence a man of great insight, a man of great innovation and accomplishment, and somebody who is incredibly busy, and we're remarkably lucky to have him here joining us tonight. Please welcome Dr. Rajiv Shaw. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dean Brownell, for that generous introduction and your continued partnership. Uh, the Sanford School of Public Policy is a superb example of world-class education coupled with real-life policy engagement. 
Uh, I hope to have the chance someday to hear your bluegrass band play, but uh, I think that may not be tonight. I know President Broadhead couldn't be here uh, this afternoon. We had a chance to see him this morning, and I want to recognize his critical leadership. Programs like Duke Engage and Bass Connections uh, have empowered students to tackle some of the toughest problems our world faces, and we're immensely impressed with what this university is doing. So many talented leaders here at Duke that uh, it's uh, hard to identify any, any one of them, but to the students here, I hope you fully appreciate uh, that you walk amongst stars and, and you get the chance to learn from people who've made incredible contributions to society. It's particularly special to acknowledge and, and recognize Congressman David Price, who's here and who is someone who, of course, is already and continues to make uh, those same contributions. Congressman, thank you for being here. And, we know how challenging things are in Washington, so uh, you probably, like I, feel wonderful being outside of D.C. <laughs> for a little bit. I also want to note there's some very important members of my policy, science, and technology teams uh, with me here today. It turns out that it seems like half of the staff of USAID comes from Duke, uh, or, it, or bleeds blue in some sense, and uh, Paul Weisenfeld, Tony Pippa, Alex Dagan, Michelle Shimp, and Takora Jones are all amongst you. Could you guys put your hands up just so folks can see you? And I hope you'll get a chance to speak with them or talk to them after uh, as well. They're incredibly outstanding leaders that I'm, I'm proud to work with. Uh, I can see that uh, colleagues are here from nearby high schools and as far away as Morocco, and I'm uh, genuinely honored to be able to deliver a lecture in such an incredible setting uh, and named for one of our nation's greatest public servants. <coughs> With the heart of a teacher and the experience of a soldier, President Sanford challenged his students to transform the world around him. And through generations, Duke University has answered that call. It's of the human genome to uncovering new leads in the search for an AIDS vaccine Duke researchers and scholars have set their sights on some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Thirst for translating knowledge into opportunity has shaped our nation's economy. The most technologically advanced, the most innovative, and still today the most dynamic economy in history. The race to the skies helped build a constellation of satellites that of global positioning data in the palms of our hands. The invention of the computer chip and ARPANET helped create a flourishing valley of entrepreneurs with the desire to change the world and the confidence to actually do it. And the discovery of new seeds sparked a green revolution, saving hundreds of millions of people from starvation and transforming farms and agriculture from North Carolina to India. With stumbles and new starts, the growth of this innovation economy remains the defining feature of American strength, and even today, the source of American jobs. But today, our innovation economy must adapt to an extraordinary new trend that is quietly and powerfully reshaping the world in which we live. All around us, the global middle class is changing. For centuries, less than 1% of the world's population enjoyed the privileges that come with a little extra money in your pocket to spend on school for your children or improvements to your home. By 1990, it numbered 1.8 billion people, the vast majority of whom lived in North America, Europe, and Japan. But over the last two decades, Growth in emerging economies has turned billions of people into pr producers and consumers, creating both economic opportunities and real challenges, including real and painful disruptions for many working American families. By 2025, the global middle class is expected to more than double, growing to 4.2 billion people, 80% of whom will live in nations often associated today with their battles with poverty and instability. 
including places like Nigeria, Tunisia, Colombia, and Cambodia. For the first time in world history, the number of people in the middle class will exceed the number of people still struggling to meet their basic human needs. As this center of gravity shifts, it will have as great an impact on the futures of Fortune 500 companies as it will on the careers of Duke and nearby high school students. As business school graduates, you'll be seeking footholds in cities we don't talk much of today, but are fast becoming the consumption capitals of tomorrow. Places like Medan in Indonesia or Wambo in Angola. As medical school graduates, you'll be considering how community clinics can provide advanced care to patients at a fraction of the cost of today's American-style hospitals. And as public policy graduates, you'll be analyzing the experiences of developing countries that have risen for what they can teach us about spurring job growth and opportunity. In fact, it's been estimated that annual consumption in emerging markets will reach $30 trillion per year over the next 15 years, an opportunity American companies are already seizing today. Just this Tuesday, Apple released two new iPhones, one of which is a low-cost model targeted at, market abroad, at markets abroad. And Citibank is building mobile money platforms to bring in hundreds of millions of new customers stretching from rural Haiti to urban slums in the Philippines. If you consider that every billion dollar in U.S. exports supports roughly 5,000 American jobs today, estimated export growth to sub-Saharan Africa alone over the next five years could help deliver up to 60,000 new American jobs. But I don't need to tell you any of this. You all work and study in one of the most productive and enterprising innovation hubs in the world, the Research Triangle Park. For the last 40 years, this park has grown by an average of six significant new companies and 1,800 new jobs a year, with each job doubling or tripling its direct economic impact through its secondary effects. And I believe that if you committed what you do best already, exploring new ideas, creating new innovations, and turning them into entrepreneurial new business starts, if you apply that to the task of global development, we will not only advance human progress around the world, but will lay the foundations for economic success in the global market of the future. In fact, I see that happening every day and the results genuinely are inspiring. Across the country, a small but powerful part of our economy is dedicated to bringing American innovation to global development. It includes innovation hub engineers like Duke's professor Bob Malnick, who teaches the design for the developing world class that I had a chance to take today. It includes Silicon Valley's Krista Donaldson, who leads De Design Revolution, a startup that's already building a low-cost blue LED light to treat jaundice in impoverished rural environments around the world. It includes university students like Jennifer Shen and Nina Brooks, two students I met today who are bringing the skills they've learned here in Duke's classrooms out into the field in Tanzania and in India. And it includes executives like A.J. Banda, the CEO at MasterCard, who's helping extend opportunity to millions with services that let you pay school fees or collect your salary right on your mobile phone. Two weeks ago, in fact, I had a chance to meet some of these new faces of American innovation and development. At a factory in Providence, Rhode Island called Adesia, 50 employees, including former refugees from Liberia and Burma, were making a high-energy peanut paste to feed starving children from Somalia to Syria. What's remarkable is that this factory and its jobs didn't exist 10 years ago. They're actually the result of a decade of research that USAID helped support 
to dramatically improve the science of resuscitating severely malnourished children with improved food assistance products. The mayor of Providence and the entire congressional Rhode Island delegation, as Congressman Price would point out, is only four people, <laughs> joined me on the visit to the factory floor, which sources much of its ingredients from the United States and now plans to double its operations and its local employment. Adesia is not an outlier. Today we're working with companies in Georgia, California, New Jersey, and Texas to develop the next generation of scientifically advanced life-saving food products, creating jobs at home while continuing our nation's proud history as the world's humanitarian leader. Or consider the field of energy innovation. Today, USAID works with nonprofits like We Care Solar and startup companies like Mira Gao Power that were both developed by American students to help ensure that power shortages never disrupt a child's chance to learn in Africa or a surgeon's chance to save a life in India. Although they're very small, these companies and organizations do not sit on the sidelines of the American economy. In fact, they help define it. Not only do small businesses account for almost two-thirds of all new job creation in our country, they also contribute disproportionately to innovation generating 13 times as many patents as large companies. Last year, the New York Times reported that without startups, the United States would have had an annual net increase in jobs in only seven times in the last 36 years. And for a startup, there's nowhere better to make your home than in an intensely competitive and collaborative innovation hub like Research Triangle Park. Today, hundreds of these hubs pepper the country, from California to Boston to North Carolina, offering inventors and entrepreneurs exciting opportunities to serve at the intersection of social good and business. If you're not yet focused on the challenges of the world's most vulnerable people, we hope you will be, because your commitment will not only deliver for our economy, but it enhances our national character. Our students will have the science, technology, engineering, and math skills they need to compete in whatever they choose to do the rest of their life. Our businesses will have an established presence in the markets of the future. Our communities will be more global-minded and better connected to the world as it will be. And our kids will be inspired by the moral contributions they will make to humanity. Now, the truth is big development institutions haven't always been well positioned to help you connect to the challenges that exist in the farthest corners of the globe. So we did something a bit unusual in Washington. We tried to change. In the last three years at USAID, we've rebuilt our policy and budget capabilities, adopted a rigorous approach to evaluation and transparency. You can find our evaluations on an iPhone application that I hope you will download and use, so there'll be more than just me using it. <laughs> uh, we hired more than 1,100 new staff, made tough choices, actually shutting down and reallocating about a third of all of our programs around the world and invested in a broad range of new programs to enhance our partnerships with universities, entrepreneurs, scientists, and inventors. Over the past five years, President Obama has launched three major global development initiatives to focus our efforts and rally the world behind ambitious but achievable goals, eradicating widespread hunger, ending preventable child and maternal death, and bringing electricity to impoverished communities around the world that lack simple access to energy. But in order for America to lead the achievement of each of these goals, we need you. We need you to focus on the 300,000 mothers who die in childbirth and the 7 million children who die before the age of five every year, almost all of them in remote and rural settings and almost all relatively easily preventable. 
The United States remains the world's most generous investor in global health, and President Obama has consistently committed more than $8 billion a year to deliver dramatic results in this field of work. But we need to do more, especially in saving lives within the first 48 hours of birth. So we partnered with an organization called Changamka, which is Swahili for cheer up. They've developed prepaid smart cards that women can top up with their mobile phones and use to pay for prenatal checkups and prescriptions. This afternoon, I had a chance to meet the organization's founding director, Zach Ulu, who is one of this year's CAD innovators. CAD, or the Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator here at Duke, was launched to tackle this core problem in global health. Today, it's part of a network of seven USAID development innovation laboratories that we've seeded on college campuses throughout our country. Duke University beat out more than 400 other world-class institutions for a spot in this higher education solutions network, precisely because of your extraordinary commitments to bringing science and technology to the challenges of the world's most vulnerable. We need you to focus on the nearly 860 million people who will go to bed hungry this evening. When President Obama took office, the world was mired in the midst of a food, fuel, and financial crisis that brought millions of people back across the brink and into poverty. <coughs> As one of the first foreign policy acts of his presidency, President Obama launched a major global effort to end hunger through business and science. In this last year, we've helped seven million farm households transform their fields and reach 12 million children through this program with improved basic nutrition. But we need to do more. We know that temperatures will grow warmer, rains more erratic, and droughts more regular and vicious in precisely those settings that are most vulnerable to extreme poverty and suffering. In order to help set these communities on a path from dependence, dependency to resilience, we need new solutions to the combined challenges of extreme poverty and extreme climate. That means not only working with long-standing research partners like Kansas State and Virginia Tech to develop new drought-tolerant seeds, but it also means harnessing the power of the private sector to take those technologies to real scale. I know John Bewley is here with his social enterprise class tonight. Before he became a professor at the Fuqua School, John was a leader at J.P. Morgan, where he spearheaded a complex and groundbreaking effort with our agency to invest $25 million in 20 game-changing agricultural businesses across East Africa. Today, one of those businesses, Newack Farm, reaches 5,000 smallholder producers with the highest quality seeds around. And we need you to focus on the 600 million people across Africa who lack access to electricity, crippling the ability of businesses to grow and create jobs. Recognizing that this challenge is the single greatest barrier to growth on the African continent, President Obama, while in Africa just two months ago, launched Power Africa to double energy production on the continent. Now, we're going to be working with some big partners, from General Electric to Standard Charter, to develop big power projects and invest in extending grid systems much farther than they currently go. We know that's an important part of solving this problem. But we also know with certainty that a formal electricity grid is not going to reach millions of people who live in rural villages anytime soon. So we need your help to invent solar-powered or wind-powered mini-grids that offer children a light to read by after the sun goes down. Through our new Development Innovation Ventures Fund, we're investing in a team of young graduates who started a company called Egg Energy to provide families with rechargeable batteries that they can rent to power their homes for five nights at a time. In Tanzania, where 90% of people lack access to sustained electricity, 
but 80% live within five kilometers of the power grid. This could help a generation of children grow up with light. That's the purpose of the Development Innovation Venture Fund, to support entrepreneurs who have a great idea and need resources to test it. If they can prove through rigorous evaluation that their ideas work, we can help them bring their solutions to scale. But we're not going to stop there. Earlier this year, in the State of the Union Address, President Obama called upon all of us to lead the world in ending extreme poverty, and to do it within the next two decades. It was an extraordinary moment as the President set forth a vision for one of the greatest contributions to human progress in history. Now I know what you're thinking. I know it's easy to be skeptical or to say that such calls are simple rhetoric. But consider this. In the last 20 years alone, human ingenuity and entrepreneurship around the world have reduced child mortality rates by 42% and poverty rates by 48%, lifting more than 600 million people above the dollar and a quarter a day poverty line. In fact, hardly anyone noticed in 2005 when for the first time in human history, <coughs> poverty rates began falling in every region of the world simultaneously, including Africa. By further accelerating these trends, we can lift one billion people from the most gut-wrenching, dehumanizing conditions of extreme poverty. And we can do this within the next two decades. But we can't do it alone. The only way we'll get there, the only way, is by mobilizing the energy and ingenuity of a new generation of students, inventors, and entrepreneurs to deliver results on a scale we haven't before seen. No one knows this better than Aaron Williams, the former director of the Peace Corps, who's here tonight. Aaron, say hi. <laughs> a hero to many in my agency, including me, Aaron has done more than anyone to sustain our nation's legacy of service and compassion abroad. In many ways, by setting America's innovators and young people on the path to end extreme poverty, and by doing it by applying their science skills, their technology skills, and their innate desire to serve using the skills that will power their career, we're building the Peace Corps of our future. <coughs> Over a hundred years ago, a German mathematician named David Hilbert gave a speech in Paris where he presented a list of the 23 most important unsolved math problems of his time. It galvanized the world of science, setting mathematicians from Zurich to Princeton on the trail of elusive solutions. And a group of energized mathematicians is something to really watch. <laughs> Hilbert asked, who among us would not be happy to lift the veil behind which is hidden? the future. Since then, mathematicians around the world have kept a list of unsolved problems to ponder from time to time. In 2008, DARPA, the Pentagon's advanced research agency, announced 23 new problems in the same spirit that it hoped it could help resolve by catalyzing major new breakthroughs. Now, I know we're not all mathematicians, and thankfully so. But we do have our own set of challenges to solve. And like mathematicians, we should be putting them on our whiteboards and thinking about them every day. <coughs> How can we bring off-grid light to millions of people who still live in the dark? How can we teach a child to read who may never set foot inside a classroom? How can we ensure that a mother can give birth safely without having a doctor by our, her side? These are questions that many leaders ask themselves far too late in life. But institutions like SEAD and what you're doing here at Duke has a lot of great innovators, young people, students and faculty members studying the answers to these questions every day. These answers can't simply be new gadgets and new technologies. The development landscape is littered with great ideas that have failed to change lives at scale. 
without considering manufacturing or pricing or distribution or adoption, without robust business plans and a knowledge of how to affect public policy, these are not going to succeed at transforming the world around us. But the truth is that we work in a field that is begging not only for your compassion and your humanity, but also your critical eye and your analytic judgment. Continue to choose to work at the intersection of service and entrepreneurship. Build businesses to serve the urban poor, not just in Detroit, but also in Delhi. Invent tools for poll workers to monitor elections, not just in Kabul, but also in Miami. <laughs> Design mobile applications to monitor extractive industries, not only in Canada, but also in the Congo. As you do, you'll be creating jobs for communities at home, even as you expand opportunities for the world's most vulnerable abroad. And we, and so many of us in the development community, will be there to help bridge the ingenuity of your innovations with a pathway out of poverty for millions of people around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. We'll now have time for a question and answer period. And there is a microphone here, gentlemen there already, and one right up above him on the first floor there. So if you'd like to ask questions about your shop, please find your way to one of the microphones and we'll begin the question and answer period. Um, Dr. Shaw has to leave immediately after the question and answer period to catch a flag. But thankfully, one of his chief colleagues in the KID administrator, Tony Kay, the one by the way, has agreed to say I can. I'm not sure if that mic, though, if others can. Here from Carborough High School. Wow. No, sir, the mic may be on. Would you mind trying it again? Yes, hi. Good, so I'm wondering, in terms of thinking about innovation, if you've come across an idea within the last few years that has been so bold that has caused you to rethink your idea on a particular issue, and then two, if you think there is a good book about innovation that my students would benefit from reading. Those are tough questions. <laughs> you guys do this to everybody, you see? Well, first, let me say how exciting it is to have, uh, have you all here. It, it really makes it special, and it proves the point that you uh, are the most powerful generation ever when it comes to connecting your ideas and your ingenuity to solving some of the world's most pressing challenges. Uh, you know, I, I see lots of different innovations, and uh, they range from using mobile phones to help women in Bangladesh uh, manage their pregnancy by sending text messages about feeding their children, uh, you know, to uh, solar-powered systems that work in rural communities, uh, efforts to bring new medical diagnostic technologies. Uh, there's one that's where you can use your iPhone to take a picture of a blood smear and it automatically reports whether or not you have malaria that students are trying to develop at Berkeley. I saw today in the lab I was in how right here at Duke you're using a 3D printer to mock up a iPhone-based otoscope which allows people to look inside a, a child's ear and uh, make a diagnosis. Uh, you know, all of these are phenomenally inspiring innovations and each of them changes the way we think about solving a problem. The malaria one's a good example. Uh, you know, if you can take the trip to the laboratory out of the process of diagnosing infectious disease, uh, you can take a lot of the cost structure of saving lives out of the system. Uh, 
uh, if you can invent new ways to create refrigeration that doesn't need to be plugged in and can last for a long time, you can all of a sudden get vaccines out to rural uh, places in you know, Eastern Congo where kids uh, are dying of very simple causes. Uh, so I guess I would say that I see lots of innovations. The challenge is having the skill set, the perseverance, the humility, and the desire to connect those ideas to the reality of the places where you're trying to do this work. And if I were a high school kid, you know, I'd be probably a little intimidated by how do you get out to South Sudan safely to understand whether, you know, your idea works or not. Uh, but I'd also be pretty inspired by the fact that increasingly there are avenues for doing that. Uh, certainly at the university level, we want to work with students that have that interest. We have, uh, as was mentioned, almost uh, 10,600 employees uh, scattered across 80 countries in the world, including this one. And uh, you know, we think that can be a platform for inviting in student groups that are trying to test new ideas. So I'm going on and on. I, I, I just think I don't want to discourage you all. It's hard work, but it's deeply, deeply rewarding. And uh, let, let me take one last thing, and I'm sorry. All the other answers will be shorter, I promise. Uh, but since you guys are in high school, I, one of the things I get to do in my job is uh, I swear in uh, and, and administer the oath of office to senior leaders at USAID that are going out to lead missions. And, and they might lead a mission of three, four hundred people and, you know, five, six hundred million dollars of annual spending that reaches every corner of Kenya, for example. And during those uh, mission director swearings in, they'll talk about their career. And the way they talk about the value and the inspiration of a life of service is so inspiring to me. I just wish I could put it in a bottle and have you all get a chance to hear it. Uh, but there's something deeply rewarding about doing this type of work, and sometimes it takes a long time to figure that out. Let me add my voice to that of Dr. Shaw to welcome the high school students who are here. I'm just making a wild guess that Carborough school colors are purple. <laughs> but it's really nice, nice of you to be here, and we hope you come back for many other events here, uh, and you might even have suggestions for people we might invite. Oh, through. and here's one other thing on the book. I'm going to have Alex Deegan. Alex, put your hand up. Alex is going to put together a packet of readings for your class and for everyone who's interested, and it'll have information about our programs and, uh, and, and some sort of thing. So thanks, Alex. He's got plenty of time on his hands. Don't worry about it. We go upstairs. Um, Mary, do you know? Be because I have a medical background? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question, for those of you who didn't hear, thank you for the question, is how does being a doctor change the way um, I do my job? I should start with the very uh, real admission that I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> I don't have a license and I don't practice, uh, nor should I at this point. So, uh, you know, I'll, well, I'll say two things. One is in the health field, and I think this is true of all fields. I think it is very useful to have real technical expertise and to be able to couple that technical expertise with a, an understanding of how the world works in some really tough parts of the world. Uh, you know, I, I have that technical expertise in, in medicine, uh, but we have colleagues that have that in, uh, in agriculture and energy and water resource management and environmental sciences. Uh, working on development, I think, uh, it is, it's an outstanding background if you have some area of technical expertise and then some real exposures to the settings in which you do this work. Uh, so, so that's very helpful. I'd say other than that, you know, I'm just struck by how much health, how much opportunity there is in global health specifically. Uh, and Mike Merson is here, so you guys can all uh, talk to him afterwards and he'll get all the details right. But the bottom line is 
we're on a path we've never been on before. And between now and 2030 or 2035, we will get the number of children who die under the age of five down from seven. It used to be 20, then it was 12, now it's seven. We're gonna get it down to under two. And uh, that's going to transform the parts of the world where still a lot of children die. And it also is gonna be one of the greatest moral accomplishments in history. Um, it, unfortunately, we don't get enough attention for talking about uh, this work, cause, but it's, it is one of the big profound success stories that's gonna take place right here in the next couple of decades. And I think everyone who gets to be a part of it is gonna be deeply proud of that service. Does this work? Okay. Hi, my name is Dominique Beaudry and I'm an undergraduate studying public policy and education. Um, so naturally, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate more on where the education piece falls into all of these programs. Um, a lot of the innovation, critical thinking, skills development um, is essential for the success of these programs, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that plans to be materialized. Uh, and when you say education, do you, do you mean education of, of students and partners here in the United States that are working on these issues, or do you mean in the places like we Like international development programs based on education. Oh, right. So, uh, well, you know, I, education has been an interesting, has been on a very interesting trajectory internationally. Uh, we've seen a huge influx, more than 40 million kids that didn't go to school are now going to school. Uh, it's, a, it's a major success story between 2000 and today. The problem is, in too many of those settings, kids uh, go to school, they get overcrowded, or they were already were overcrowded. The teaching instruction is poor, the infrastructure is poor, uh, and the kids aren't learning much. And so I have met with kids in you know, Malawi that are part of that influx. Their second grade literacy levels have actually gone down a little bit. I've met with kids in South Sudan that have been in conflict environments, so they're 12, 13, 14, they've never been to school, absorbing them into an educational system becomes very, very difficult. The good news is I think like other fields, we're bringing more science and evidence to how to do this. Uh, we have a very good, and I think Duke played an important role in helping to establish this somehow, but we have this uh, EGRA, this early grade reading assessment that can be done very quickly to understand our kids' learning and are they improving their literacy scores. USAID has a new education strategy with two major goals. One is to get 100 million kids who are in schools to improve their literacy scores during early grades. And the second is to get 15 million kids who are not in school into school. And, and I'll just say one final thing. There's a young woman named Malala Yousafzai. Have any of you heard about her? You have. She was uh, shot while on a bus in Pakistan because she wanted to go to school and she was shot in the head. She survived. Uh, she moved to London with her family to get medical care. She has a book coming out in a few weeks that I haven't read, but I'd rec go ahead and recommend. And she's been giving speeches on the need for girls to go to school. And I'll just say, you know, USAID supports 3.2 million girls in Pakistan to get an education. In Afghanistan, we went from having about two million kids in school, no girls, to now eight million kids in school, about 35% uh, are girls. And that is going to be a critical part of whether that country succeeds after the military goes away. So I think there's huge promise and opportunity. I'm deeply proud of some of the gains we've made, but we have a lot to do together. Thank you so much. Hi, um, my name is Chisom. I'm an undergrad biomedical engineer here at Duke. And I wanted to know what you thought about USAID's uh, involvement with the private sector and the countries that it works with and whether you thought we could make it better or worse or whatever. Well, thank you. I, I believe strongly that the future of achieving success against actually solving these problems requires a deep and abiding partnership between the public and private sectors. Uh, it used to be the case 50, 60 years ago when these institutions were created, USAID, the World Bank, others, that we were basically a substitute for foreign investment or private investment in countries. Today, even if you take out rapidly emerging middle-income economies, uh, we're outnumbered by foreign direct investment by probably $14 for every dollar that comes out of the official development sector. 
Um, and so when you look at it that way, you guys say, well, if you really want to tackle these problems, you want to partner with and leverage the private uh, solutions that exist out there. And I'll just give you one example. We've been working hard to uh, answer the president's call to address extreme hunger and poverty in sub-Saharan Africa through agricultural development. Uh, and we've made great, great, great strides. But one of the things I'm most proud of is we brought 70 companies together. Half of them are from Africa. The rest are split from Europe and Asia and the United States. We worked with country governments to change their policies and, and regulations so they can be more investor friendly. And we secured $3.75 billion of private investment commitments to African agriculture in those six, now nine, countries. And USAID then uses its resources to uh, help those projects move forward a little bit. So what happens is for every dollar we spend, we're getting a dollar from a local government and two dollars from the private sector. So we're getting much more leverage for our investment. Uh, and that's why we see the scale we're seeing. Seven million farmers reached already. Our goal is to reach 50 million and to really change the structure of the food economy in many of these countries. That's only going to happen with real private partnership. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Is this on? Yep. OK. Um, so I'm a medical student here at Duke. And I was curious, uh, you, you commented this a, a little bit, just barely, in answering that other question. But I'm curious if you could comment a little bit more on what USAID does to work, with, work in countries to foster organic, bottom-up approaches to development that originate from the country themselves rather than kind of these top-down approaches. Well, thank you. Well, we call that local solutions, and we've made the search for and the investment in local solutions a central part of our key reform, which we call USAID Forward. I, I was joking earlier because I know you have a Duke Forward capital campaign, and this is a little different. Uh, but you know, our, our goal, when, I, when we started, we looked and we said, look, we spend about uh, a little less than uh, 7 or 8 percent of our total resources on what we'd call local solutions, directly investing in local institutions that have developed those bottom-up uh, answers. We, are, we have set a target for ourselves to achieve 30 percent. Uh, we're at about 15 percent today, and we're just going to keep marching towards the target. So uh, by the way, the tar we didn't just arbitrarily set that. We looked across the board and said, where can you know, those types of solutions make a big difference? <coughs> Uh, so that's part of the answer, is just in a structured way, changing the way we do development to be more respectful and open and easier to work with for local partners. But a second part of it is really in everything we do, from developing country strategies to designing large-scale programs, being inclusive of a broad range of local actors so that they're part of designing programs, evaluating programs, implementing programs, has become a more and more, and more important part of how development works. Uh, when it works. And frankly, when we don't do that, we can build roads and bridges and, and power plants and what have you, but they just don't survive uh, when we go away. So uh, for us, success is creating the conditions where we can leave, and that requires build finding and investing in those local solutions and also building the kinds of institutions that will replace us over time. Thank you. I don't see anybody at the mic down here, so we'll go up there again. Hi, my name is Sunny. Um, I'm a freshman here, and I was just wondering, um, what is one thing that you wish that every American knew about USAID? Uh, I, I would say that, that the answer would be that we spend far less than 1% of the federal budget. And, and for that amount of expenditure, we have those 8 million kids and 3.5 million girls in school in Afghanistan. We've supported a health effort in Afghanistan that's led to the fastest and largest reductions in maternal and child mortality anywhere in the world. We have more than four million people getting AIDS drugs, keeping them alive. We reached seven million farmers and have helped 12 million kids move out of a condition of severe malnutrition. And within that same budget envelope, we lead the entire world for every major humanitarian response from Haiti to the floods in Pakistan to the crisis in Syria, where even today, we have hundreds of local partners in Syria reaching all 14 governments, uh, reaching uh, hospitals and field hospitals that have performed tens of thousands of surgeries. I've met Syrian-American surgeons who we've sent in uh, 
uh, and they tell stories of literally taking shrapnel out of babies and coming back across the border. So when I spent a lot of my time, as Congressman knows, uh, in Congress trying to explain what we do and whether it's efficient and results oriented and you can measure and track the outcomes, but I consider every penny of that investment is so critical to the way America projects its moral values around the world and the way we keep our economy and our country strong. I think it's, as Lindsey Graham has said, a, a prominent Republican partner of ours, uh, it's the best return on investment we've got for our national security and for our country. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, thanks for coming. My name is John Buley. Uh, your work in, with the administration in bringing economic development and the moral <coughs> issues is well known. How do, you, how do the emerging leaders in business, public policy, and medicine, and liberal arts take the message away as well, what our research has shown, which is the beneficial impacts to our economy and how many jobs are created in our economy in the U.S. for every dollar that we spend? Thank you. Well, thank you, John, and thanks for your uh, personal commitment and, and the work that you've done. I, I just think it's telling that we live in a time when, you know, we now have hundreds of private sector partners, and I could go through the top 40, and it reads like, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's just every company you've heard of that is, is eager to now work with us to make sure that they have a foothold in markets that they know are going to be the markets of the future. Uh, and where they know the quality of their brand and their partnership is going to be defined by how those countries perceive their engagement. And, you know, I, I think it's telling that, uh, that this is no longer really just charity. This is a core part of our economic strategy over time. Consider this. South Korea and Taiwan were the two biggest recipients of American food aid decades ago. Today, we have more jobs in this country because of our trade relationship with South Korea than we do our trade relationship with France. So, it, you know, it's easy to look at some of the cities I mentioned or countries I might have been talking about and say, boy, that's a, that's a tough place. Boy, he's not really suggesting that that's going to be a major driver of economic opportunity. Uh, but if you said that several decades ago about those places, you would have been inaccurate. So, I think, I think we have a very, very bright future, and I, I'm very excited about it, but it will take, uh, you know, constantly selling the story here. And, and maybe, Congressman, you could speak to that one, because you're on the front line of explaining what we do and why we do it and why it's worthwhile, and you've also been personally engaged in going abroad as part of these programs. Working with you and your contractors, NDI, IRI, and in, in working on governance issues. I, actually, I'd like to ask you a question about that. Okay. Because... I um, <laughs> thought he was going to answer uh, your question. Uh, no, no, you did a good job answering the question. This is, this is, uh, this repays us many times over, and you, you make that case uh, very persuasively. Um, I think there is a, uh, a dilemma often in, in foreign aid, especially when you're focusing on governance and trying to promote uh, civil society and good governance. There's a, uh, an accusation that's often made against us that we're trying to, uh, to have our way, to, 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 uh, to, to make the world over in our image, and, and that we're paternalistic and all the rest. I mean, you, you deal with that uh, all the time. Um, and as a matter of fact, there is, there are reasons for us to hope and, and work toward uh, good governance, democratic practice, a transparent uh, uh, economies. Uh, there, there are reasons to work toward that as a foreign aid goal, but it's very tricky because we do appear, appear to be uh, appear to be uh, domineering sometimes and, and demanding. And but, but there is one program, the Millennium Challenge, that that has made a uh, made a, a goal. You know, certain performance objectives by the by the recipient countries. A number of countries have bought into that and have, and have performed uh, reasonably well. But I wonder if you could, uh, at the same time, we don't make that a sole criterion. There are many places in the world we, where we give aid where the governments are atrocious, <coughs> where they don't come anywhere close to our objectives. I wonder if you could address that, that dilemma. How does, um, what, 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 to what extent should we be using foreign aid to, um, to influence and, and and practice in, in these countries and bring about practices that are more in line with our national interests, but also with our national ideals. Well, thank you, Congressman. And, and 
you've had a lot of direct experience with this because you've been part of working with uh, elected leaders in countries all around the world to uh, train and support their aspirations. But I'll just say a couple things. First, I think it is now widely acknowledged in a, in a simple best practice that if you don't have the support and partnership of governments in which in countries where you're going to do the work, you're simply not going to achieve as much of a result, especially a result that sustains over time. So uh, now, you know, Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, was created a decade ago and has been successful with that basic insight. Today, our biggest efforts in food, the security, depend on that insight. We demand policy reforms. Paul's been a part of negotiating these as part of a package of investment. In global health, we demand, uh, and I shouldn't say demand, we work really in partnership to say, okay, what's your aspiration? In Nigeria, the aspiration is to save one million children's lives. And when the government puts a credible plan together that includes serious efforts to address corruption and, and other concerns, then we can make a partnership investment that makes, uh, that makes sense. But there will always be places like Afghanistan where, uh, you know, it's, it's, less, uh, it's less direct and where we, you know, where we'll say, well, we'll do what we're doing, where we've said, look, we have gathered world leaders to make a long-term commitment to Afghan development, $16 billion over the next four years from all partners. And we've said that in order for Afghanistan to receive those resources, uh, they have to abide by a certain set of actions that, that are enshrined in something we call the Tokyo Mutual Accountability Framework. And you know, if they're not gonna pursue the commitments they've said they will pursue, then uh, we and uh, 15, 16 other of our development partners will simply not be able to make the kinds of investments that have been committed. And, you know, I think we've got to have that tough discussion in order to allow countries and their peoples to benefit from these investments. So I think what you've been doing is very important. I think this basic uh, conditional relationship is, is important. It's got to be executed in a way that's respectful and appropriate to the times. I, I do think the kind of work we do, parliament to parliament, and, and we're Makes working in partnership difference with uh, your people on the ground between our, our, our visits and our interventions, you know, that, that has to be a partnership. Yeah. That simply is not, we, we, and we don't even pretend that we can take on the worst cases. You know, we're, we, we depend, we, we, we're only there when we're invited and we're operating as partners. That's the, that's the reason we chose that, that word. Uh, so I, I'm a firm believer in, in that. Um, I do think there are tougher cases where there's just so much suffering, so much misery, so much need, and, and where um, if you are too tough on uh, the kind of criteria that you apply, yeah. you're yeah. simply going to leave out uh, uh, millions and millions of people. So we're just about at the end of our time, and I see a few more people up there wanting to ask questions. I'm hoping during the reception that will happen after this, which is up on the first floor where you folks are, uh, that you can ask Tony Pippa some of those. And so I'd like to end, end with one, one quick question. Okay, you can have two more, great, that's great. Um, I'd like to ask a, qu a quick one myself and then we'll go up okay. there. Um, and the question is this, when the, the interaction you have with the, the private sector sounds highly fruitful, and you said you know, it reads like the Dow Jones list. Um, do you ever, are you ever in a position of having to make decisions or get challenged for the decisions about who you partner with? So for example, these, you said these companies want a toehold in the emerging markets. So do you make a decision between, say, a company wanting a computer toehold yes. or a building supply toehold or an athletic shoe toehold versus a fast food company toehold? And would, could there be corporate players here who might be doing things that might be undesirable in these countries? And do you ever face those decisions? We do. We do all the time. And, uh, you know, we got to make judgments based on our criteria, which are first and foremost achieving the results we're committing to. Uh, we require our partners or we enter into partnerships where there's mutual investment. Uh, and we search for those that we think are committed to our long-term objectives. I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. One of the things we did in uh, Myanmar and Burma as it's opening up is we brought a group of technology companies and, and went there and said, let's create uh, technology centers of excellence 
at universities and higher education institutions because you meet with these students there. You know, and what they want, they want to be able to touch Google or they want to be able to go to a Cisco learning lab and develop skills that they believe will be critical to their future. We can only deliver that in partnership with those partners. So that's one example. Another one is we work with uh, agricultural companies in East Africa to create new uh, drought tolerant forms of maize. And you know, some of those companies, it's all of the big ones. So it's Syngenta, it's DuPont and Monsanto. And you know, they're, they've donated the intellectual property to us so we can ensure that there's access for people who need it. But uh, those are the kinds of partnerships we engage in. So I gather your plane's late enough to do a few more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no. So thankful. That's nice. So why don't we go up there, and thank you for being patient. Hi, Dr. Shah. So the, president, the President's Malaria Initiative has made uh, very impressive strides in global malaria control. But my question is, when will the PMI shift its focus from control to eradication? That's a very good question. I, I uh, you know, look, I, I, don't, I think the goal there is to, is to dramatically reduce and eliminate malaria as a cause of death for children uh, through Africa. They have embraced uh, the goal of elimination and the goal of eradication is, a, as you probably know better than I, a more technical determination of what it means to track whether every case of fever is not malaria for three years and, and have eradicated a disease. Uh, so I'm not the technical expert. Uh, folks here could explain it, but I, at least our team is uh, strongly of the belief that we should be working to eliminate malaria and that uh, you know, if, if the technology and the science allows us to pursue eradication, that's great too. But right now we're doing all the things we can to make sure that no one dies, no child dies of malaria, period. And I'll say I visited parts of uh, Zanzibar in uh, Africa where hospitals used to be overcrowded with children that had malaria, where today, and people would be serviced in the, in the front lawn <coughs> on cots because they were so overcrowded. Today, because of a successful uh, malaria control program, those hospitals are open to treat people that have other kinds of conditions, and it makes a transformational difference for children. Okay, we have one time for one final question. Sure. Okay. Hi, I'm one of the high school students here. So, for some, <laughs> what's yeah. your name? My name is Aaron. Aaron. All right. And, and what, year, what year are you? I'm a senior. Good. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, so, I spent the past year in Geneva, Switzerland, where I interned for an NGO called Regions 20, and it works to promote uh, connections between different regional governments in developing countries and connecting them with civil society and technology providers and so forth. And I guess this was premised on something that was new to me when I started interning with them, was the fact that getting at regional governments um, can help to bypass the bureaucracy involved with working with uh, international organizations and national governments, but uh, would also uh, f uh, facilitate change that is more durable and perhaps more, uh, stronger than local uh, and grassroots initiatives. So I was wondering if USAID does work with any uh, regional level governments and whether you can make any comments on this. Sure. Let me first just say, I mean, when I was a junior in high school, the idea of going to work on regional government partnerships based out of Geneva would have seemed very advanced for me. So congratulations. Uh, yeah, I was just a kid from suburban Detroit, and I would have been excited to go to Dayton for the weekend, uh, the, which I got to do, and it was exciting. But, but the, uh, but your, your insight is absolutely accurate that, uh, you know, we, we get to work with regional and local governments all the time. And there are lots of times where it's hard to work with a national government, but we can do very productive things with regional partners. I'll give you just one example. We've started a new product line that helps us provide uh, loan guarantees to local banks and help uh, regional governments and municipalities issue debt bond issues so they can raise money themselves, uh, which really then provides them a source of revenue to invest in infrastructure and, and grow their economy and get on their own two feet. So we, we've seen some huge successes in that area of work, and I don't know what you're going to do in the future, uh, but I would encourage you to keep at it because it's a great insight. So thank you. 
thank you all for your wonderful questions. Um, this was a, a wonderfully illuminating uh, time with you, both your presentation and your responses to the questions, and we're very happy for how gracious you were with your time. So let's please thank Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Get to join us for a reception up on the first floor and the opportunity to talk with Tom. And I want that to be my job. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. And I'll see you in a while. شوف شد معايا ديك ديك تحتانية شوف شد معايا ديك ديك هادي هادي بلاش 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 الحيد هادشي نحطو لتحت عاود عاود يلا سربي دغيا عاود عاود يصور مزيان متقلقش عاود شي وحدة أخرى تصور ياك <تصفيق> 